today, um, which in a sense continues the discussion that we heard before the coffee break. Um, it concerns dark energy and how to probe for dark energy. And uh, in this case, it concerns the remnant of the sound waves that were rushing through our early universe and which we have found still to be detectable. And they actually contain a very clear signature uh, that could be used to uh, basically constrain the parameters of dark energy. And uh, Vicente Martinez from the observatory in Valencia, who's a very good friend of mine, and um, we both had the same supervisor, so we know each other since a long time. He is going to talk about this, and um, I will give him the floor up till 6 o'clock. Okay. Okay, thank you, and thank you for the organizers to invite me, uh, taking into account that I was around during these days. Um, it's a pleasure to be in a summer school and to talk about uh, something that uh, uh, has been, uh, I have been looking at the, at the slides of other presentations, and uh, you have been already talking about the baryonic acoustic oscillations in different cases with Prothan and also in, in the talks uh, by last week that you had uh, on uh, cosmological surveys uh, by Maciek uh, Bilicki. Uh, I will, in, uh, in fact, uh, be, uh, in my talk I will try to be focused la like a talk from a, an observational astronomer more than a theoretician. I mean, I, I do a break with the previous talk. I will try to, to talk about real data um, and, try to learn, and try to learn uh, how this uh, real data informs us uh, uh, about uh, something which is quite a hot topic today and probably will be for the next 20 or 30 years, which is the dark energy in the universe. Uh, when, whenever you, you start with something, uh, uh, at a given point, uh, it's good uh, to have some tool to explain this topic to your friends uh, in a path. Okay? This is not the case for the baryonic acoustic oscillations, but I tried uh, to do um, as an introduction and also taking into account that you have already uh, li been listening during a whole week and uh, today is the last talk of the day, I decided to start with a more, a more relaxed way looking through a film that still is not finished, but it's nearly finished. Uh, still, uh, we missed to add the music. But it's a film on baryonic acoustic oscillations basically on the, the cosmic sound, I will say. The cosmic sound will be a good title for the film. Still, you don't have the titles and everything. And the, the film is the good one because it's also a challenge for you to learn Spanish, OK? Uh, but obviously, it's translated into English with subtitles. I mean, uh, many Spanish people are used to look uh, to English films at the beginning just with, with, with uh, uh, subtitles. Now we have to do the other way around. You will listen uh, to me, but I just talk at the beginning and at the end. But there are two students that talk uh, to the audience, uh, explaining the main topics of my later talk. Uh, in this part, there is no mm, formula. It's quite simple. But I think that the animations there, that also I will come back uh, in probably in a still form during the PDF talk, uh, are quite useful for understand what I am going to to say. I think that it's good also to 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 listen to the people, but because also if some of you know a bit of Spanish, you can enjoy it. This will take eight minutes, and then I will really start. Okay. Las galaxias son los elementos básicos del universo. Desde que los astrónomos aprendimos a mediados de la década de los años 20 del siglo pasado que el universo contiene infinidad de galaxias. Cuando fuimos conscientes de que éstas no se distribuyen al azar, la gravedad las hace sociables, de manera que forman grupos, cúmulos y estructuras todavía más grandes entre las que destacan filamentos y paredes que rodean grandes espacios vacíos. A esta textura cósmica la llamamos estructura a gran escala. Su descripción y estudio es fundamental para entender aspectos claves de la vida y la evolución del universo. En el año 2005, un grupo internacional liderado por el astrónomo americano Daniel Eisenstein y otro por el astrónomo británico Sean Cohn estudiaron con detalle grandes catástrofes.
catálogos que contienen las posiciones en el espacio tridimensional de cientos de miles de galaxias en volúmenes descomunales. Ambos grupos descubrieron casi simultáneamente una peculiaridad en la distribución de las galaxias. El nombre técnico de este descubrimiento es poco explícito. Los astrónomos hablan de oscilaciones acústicas bariónicas. La distribución de galaxias, como si se tratara de un fósil cosmológico, esconde una huella del pasado más remoto del universo, cuya existencia ya se había postulado en 1970 por Peter Stigiu. El análisis de cómo se distribuyen las galaxias a gran escala nos ha permitido detectar esa sutil información que los cosmólogos teóricos habían predicho hace casi 50 años. Pero vayamos por partes. ¿Qué pasó en el universo primitivo y qué clase de huella imprimió este suceso en la estructura a gran escala del universo? Minutos después de la gran explosión del Big Bang, se forman los núcleos de los átomos ligeros, fundamentalmente hidrógeno y helio, y algunos de sus isótopos, como el deuterio o el tritio, pero no se pudieron formar los átomos estables, ya que en esta época la radiación domina sobre la materia y si un núcleo capta a un electrón con la intención de formar un átomo, inmediatamente un fotón muy energético interactúa impidiendo que el enlace permanezca. La materia se encuentra completamente ionizada, formando un plasma denso y caliente en el que no hay átomos, solo núcleos, electrones y fotones. Además, están los neutrinos que viajan a casi la velocidad de la luz y finalmente la materia oscura cuya naturaleza todavía desconocemos. Los núcleos están formados por neutrones y protones a los que colectivamente los físicos llaman cariones. En este plasma primitivo sabemos que existen regiones ligeramente más densas que su entorno. Estas pequeñísimas anomalías en la densidad se generaron por fluctuaciones cuánticas en el primer segundo después del Big Bang. Crecen, tratando de atraer gravitatoriamente materia hacia ellas, pero al mismo tiempo, una densidad mayor de fotones implica mayor presión de radiación, que contrarresta la caída gravitatoria de materia. Hay oscilaciones, la gravedad intenta que la materia colapse, y la presión de los fotones ejerce el efecto contrario. Como los fotones y el gas de bariones están acoplados en un único fluido a muy alta temperatura, la radiación arrastra a los bariones en una onda esférica que viaja a la velocidad del sonido, que para ese plasma es aproximadamente la mitad de la velocidad de la luz. Estas ondas sónicas dejaron su huella tanto en la radiación cósmica de fondo como en la distribución de galaxias a gran escala. La materia oscura es inmune a la presión de radiación. Solo responde a la gravedad ya que no interacciona con prácticamente nada y por tanto permanece en el centro de la onda sónica. El universo siguió en este estado durante más de 300.000 años. 380.000 años después del Big Bang, cuando la temperatura ha decrecido suficientemente para que los fotones dejen de interaccionar con los bariones, se forman por primera vez átomos estables. Los fotones, a partir de ahora, pueden viajar libremente y son los mismos que hoy detectamos como la radiación cósmica de fondo. La presión de radiación disminuye abruptamente, dejando un casquete de bariones en torno al centro de la fluctuación de densidad que quedaría como congelado. Es semejante al efecto que se produciría si lanzáramos un puñado de piedras a un estanque. Estas formarían numerosas ondas de agua. Imaginemos que de repente el agua se congelase. En nuestro caso, los centros y bordes de las ondas congeladas estaban formados por acumulaciones de materia en las que con el paso del tiempo se van a formar muchas de las galaxias que vemos actualmente. Estudiando la distribución de galaxias, hemos confirmado el descubrimiento de estas ondas congeladas, ya que la teoría y las observaciones cosmológicas predicen que hoy, debido a la expansión cósmica, deberían tener un radio de unos 500 millones de años luz. Y lo que precisamente detectamos es que a esa distancia de una galaxia dada resulta más probable que encontremos otras galaxias, si comparamos con, por ejemplo, 400 o con 600 millones de años luz. Eso es consecuencia de que estamos encontrando la señal que producen simultáneamente las galaxias que se encuentran en el centro y las que se encuentran en el borde de estas ondas. El tamaño de las oscilaciones acústicas bariónicas es una regla que podemos utilizar para medir el universo. Una regla es un objeto de tamaño conocido cuyo tamaño aparente nos informa de cómo de lejos se encuentra y por tanto nos revela a qué ritmo se está expandiendo el universo. Esto es relevante, pues los cosmólogos piensan hoy que existe en el universo 
una componente que no es materia ni es radiación, que llamamos energía oscura y que produce que la expansión cósmica esté a tres años. Se esperaba que la expansión cósmica descubierta por Eugen Hubble en 1929 estuviera ralentizándose, pero se observa lo contrario. Este hecho es tan desconcertante como si la una piedra al aire observáramos que no volviera a la Tierra, sino que continuara su trayectoria ascendente incrementando constantemente su velocidad. Pues bien, disponer de una regla nos permite estudiar el ritmo de la expansión cósmica en las diferentes épocas de la historia del universo. Y por tanto, el estudio de las oscilaciones acústicas variónicas aporta información para conocer la naturaleza de la energía oscura. En este reto están enmarcados muchísimos proyectos de investigación internacionales. Por ejemplo, en el Observatorio de la Universidad de Valencia y con financiación como grupo de excelencia prometeo de la Generalitat Valenciana, estamos colaborando con un estudio astronómico que pretende medir los parámetros físicos de la misteriosa energía oscura, esa que provoca la expansión acelerada del universo. A tal fin, llevaremos a cabo un cartografiado del cielo visible desde el hemisferio norte, obteniendo las posiciones y las distancias de más de 90 millones de galaxias. Con estas posiciones, con estos datos, podemos medir con precisión el tamaño aparente de las oscilaciones acústicas bariónicas en diferentes momentos de la historia cósmica. Como tiene una escala conocida, la de las ondas congeladas mencionada antes, esta información nos permite conocer el ritmo de expansión del universo. Para llevar a cabo este programa de investigación, estamos utilizando un nuevo telescopio de 2,5 metros de diámetro que está instalado en el Observatorio Astrofísico de Jabalán, en Teruel, y que pronto empezará sus observaciones. Sin duda, el Observatorio de Jabalán y el proyecto j -Pass van a contribuir de manera muy relevante a desvelar el misterio de la energía oscura. Bueno, pues uh, this is was just exactly uh, the, the idea of the talk, and then now I'm going to go in detail to all these things, but uh, I think that uh, this provides an overview of the rest of the talk. Uh, and um, this is now the moment to start with more technical aspects, and in particular, what uh, you have seen there is that uh, we need a statistical descriptor because uh, what at the end we will have is a standard ruler. But it's a ruler that we can only measure in a statistical way. I mean, we cannot, we cannot have just uh, uh, a way of measuring it directly, but just using statistics. And this is the idea of, uh, of uh, this talk on baryonic acoustic oscillations. I will go in detail on the physics, but previously, uh, because I have been checking, and you have been through these topics around, uh, uh, along the school, but not with the detail that I need, I have uh, put an introduction on the correlation function and power spectrum. Later, I will talk about the physics of the baryonic acoustic oscillation that previously has been more or less outlined in the film. Then I will talk about the previous detections and the, the detections that are, are up to now. I really don't care too much about the details of the to most up-to-date detections. This is something that you can easily find in the literature, but I prefer being this in school to, to keep on the topics uh, in, the, in a way that they can be understood well. And uh, finally, I will propose a way of reconstruct these baryonic acoustic oscillations. At the end of the talk, I will present uh, the, this project, the j -Pass project, which is a photometric redshift project that we are carrying on with a telescope of 2.5 meters uh, very um, close to my house, at about 110 kilometers from my house. But in the inner part, I live from, in Valencia, which is in the coast, uh, and it's very nice, but if you go to the inner part of the Spain, you, you reach to a mountain of around 2,000 uh, meters of uh, uh, altitude. Uh, in, in a place with very dark skies, and uh, we, we got money, and we, we have built a telescope there, and, uh, and we are constructing, um, uh, we are now starting the J-PASS project, will be a photometric redshift survey. I will explain also these details. I see that you talk um, a lot also on photometric redshift surveys uh, last week uh, by Maciek Bilisky, and um, but before to go into that sample that is still we don't have data, I will talk 
uh, about another sample called the Alhambra sample uh, that it was done with the telescope, uh, 3.5 meters telescope in uh, Calar Alto in Almeria. And it was more or less a precursor of what j pass Havalambre uh, Pau survey will be, okay? Now we focus more or less on the mathematical aspect of the statistics of the galaxy distribution. And for sure, the main measure of the galaxy clustering that probably many of you already know is the two-point correlation function. The two-point correlation function is a quantity that is defined in this way. We have to define the joint probability that in two separate volumes, infinitesimal volumes, dv1, dv2, we find a galaxy in each of them, okay? And the important thing is that we are dealing with the separation of these two volumes. The vector separation of these two volumes is the, the quantity, and this quantity here is uh, the correlation function. In fact, the probability is just proportional to the density square and the volumes. And then if the process is completely random, this quantity will be zero, okay? Because uh, the number of ob the probability of having two objects uh, separated at a given distance will be directly proportional to the average density squared and the volume of each of the uh, um, small uh, patches. Okay, but if you have clustering, it's clear that this quantity will be larger than zero. Okay, and what is measuring is exactly the excess over a Poisson distribution of Mm, the chance of finding a galaxy at a given distance of another one, okay? And this is the excess probability which we are measuring, okay? Here you have another representation, more or less of the same, uh, by Matsubara, in which you have uh, also the reference of the first uh, measurement of the uh, galaxy two-point correlation function by Tuchuhi Ikihara in 1969. You have the two volumes, you have the distance. If you, the process is isotropic and homogeneous, uh, you can just mm, define this function as a, a function of the modulus of the distance. You, you don't need to have the vector distance in that case. And this is the, the probability of having both gal uh, galaxies in both cells, okay? This is clear, and this is a well-defined quantity. Now, as a well-defined quantity, this goes quite well to many cosmological theories, you will see that, in fact, uh, as a theoretical um, measure, measurement, the power spectrum is, a, is a slightly better, we will see later, okay? But going back to the detection, it was in this paper in 1969, where uh, just looking to the galaxies projected on, this, on the sphere, using the, the catalog compiled by Shane and Wirtainen in 1967, and then using a kind of limber deprojection, limber function to deproject, mm, these two authors uh, mm, measure for the first time the two-point correlation function, and they always uh, fit it to a power law, and uh, what they were doing is basically to count the number of pairs with a given separation and to compare that number with the same number of pairs for a completely random catalog, for a Poisson in catalog, okay? This ratio gives you the excess probability. Obviously, if uh, in the numerator you have already a Poisson catalog, already a, a non-clustered po point process, you have one, and then the correlation function is zero, okay? Whenever this is larger than the denominator, you get an excess over one, and this is what you really want to measure. Okay, this was the result, and within that time, there were no embodied simulations to compare with, and, uh, uh, but it was very interesting because uh, in that time, there were already statistical models. Uh, for instance, some of them were popularized by, by Jim Peebles, one by Newman and Scott, was the one that they used to compare the real data, the, the real power law that they have fit. Okay, uh, but this is the first uh, calculation of the two-point correlation function on a catalog mm, just to projected onto the sphere. Okay, but it's quite remarkable. I mean, it's, you know, uh, nearly 50 years ago. How to measure the correlation function? Let's go in detail uh, of uh, what is the idea. I mean, I, I will sh show several more standard estimators, but I think that with this estimator, it's quite clear what we want to do. 
What we want to do when we want to measure the correlation function, we have to count pairs. Now imagine that your window is this square, and then we are going to see this in two dimensions. But obviously, you have to think in three, di in three dimensions in general. But uh, as an example, you, you can see in two dimensions. And wh what you can do initially is to count the number of neighbors at a given distance. But obviously, in those particles that are lie close to the boundary do not see the neighbors outside of the window. Okay? Then there are two solutions. The more poor solution uh, is to use, uh, this comes also from the, 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 the field of point processes, is to use what is called a minus estimator. An estimator that only try to account for those galaxies that are within a small window in the center, and you are interested in the correlation function at a given maximum distance. I cannot measure with this a kind of approach the correlation function at a distance larger than this value, okay? And then what I do is just look to the points inside here and count how many neighbors they see. And they are able to see the neighbors within the inner window, the inner window, this uh, with the dotted uh, square, but also in the outer window. If I go to the outer window, this point is, is unable to see neighbors outside. That means that this is what, the, the, what happens when you are using a minus estimators. And finally, what you do is just to compare for this number of points that lie within the inner windows, the number, you, you, you sit in all of them, and you count how many neighbors are within a shell between radius r and r plus dr, you put it in here, you divide by the volume of the cell, multiply by the density, which should be the number of expected uh, for a Poisson distribution, and you get uh, a, an estimator of the correlation function. But obviously this um, discard a lot of information that comes from the other points of the sample. And the, uh, the other solution is to use edge-corrected uh, edge estimators. In that sense, uh, you are assuming things about what happens outside of the window, and this certainly is a problem. But it's the way that typically we have been dealing with up to now. Uh, this has been, for instance, criticized by uh, a friend of uh, Guido, uh, Luciano Pietronero, and all these fractal people. And in that, pa and in that point, they were right. The criticism was right, you know, because you are assuming things. But whenever you know that you are assuming things, you can deal with the assumption. In that case, the, 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 the edge corrector estimators, what they basically do is just to count for the volume that uh, lies w within the window and only with the part of the volume that lies when the, the, the point that you are in, uh, considering in, in the sum is mm, close to the boundary. In that case, you don't have to count to the to total shell volume, because you don't, but you have to measure only this part, and this VI has been changing from this one to this one, and this VI is the volume that lies within the window in which you are measuring the correlation function. You have to calculate it by geometrical methods, by Monte Carlo, whatever you like. Depending on the kind of the window, you can do it even analytically. For a square, or for a cubital uh, sample, the statist statisticians have many formulae for doing that. But this is mainly a good way of seeing how the two-point correlation function ha can be calculated. More standard estimators are, for instance, the Landian Salai estimator uh, or the Naive estimator, the Davis and Peebles estimator, in which you basically count in a given volume the number of pairs in the data catalog, which is labeled here by D, capital D, the number of pairs that lie uh, at a given distance, okay, at, at, the give, at the distance R, and compare this number of pairs with the same number of pairs in a random catalog, in a catalog within the same volume within the same selection effects, within the same mask, and you generate this kind of catalog. Mm, and it, uh, it's convenient that this random catalog, uh, in order to have more statistical significance, has much more points than the data catalog. That, that means that it, then you have to correct by the, the quotient between the number of random points and the number of real data points. But what you are just doing is just a comparison between the number of pairs at the given distance in the data catalog, in the real galaxy distribution, and the number of pairs on a random generated catalog having the same boundary conditions, the same selection effects, etc. A more sophisticated, a more general estimator is the Landian Salai, which is basically the same but introduced the, the combined number of pairs between data and random. Okay? And this 
can be proved that it's quite mass stable and the, the variance is uh, less and it's probably in this moment the standard one that people use. But basically you have to count for three quantity, three histograms if you like it, mm -hmm. the, the number of pairs uh, in the random catalog uh, at a given distance, the number of pairs of the data catalog at a given distance, and the number of pairs, the cross pairs between data and random, and just normalized by the number of points in the data catalog and the number of points in the random catalog, okay? And when you do this, uh, you reproduce uh, uh, to a given extent the, same, the, fir the very first calculation of uh, Tochuhi Inkehara, okay? That also was repeated only five years later without knowing the Japanese results by Jim Peebles. I think that he didn't know that at that time, okay? And uh, the mm, standard fit of the correlation function is a power law uh, with an exponent uh, roughly of the order of 1.8 and uh, what, uh, 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 what is called a correlation length. It's a bad name. Uh, the correlation length is about 6 megaparsecs, 5, 6 megaparsecs, 6, 8 megaparsecs h minus 1 megaparsecs, and this is not really a correlation length. The only thing that this means is that at this distance, if you remember the definition of the correlation function, because you have 1 plus the correlation function, at this distance, the correlation function at r naught is 1, independent of the exponent gamma. That means that 1 plus 1 is 2, and the, at the correlation length at 5.4 h minus 1 megaparsecs, what happens is that the chance of having a neighbor is twice, 1 plus 1, twice, the, the expected for a random, completely random distribution. But certainly it is not um, a, a, a proper correlation length as other physicians and also Pietro Nero criticized that, that name and, and that was right on that. You can do it that, this also with the angular separations, in fact it was done before, and then you got also a power law in this case uh, with the angular correlation. Samples of galaxies you can use, for instance, the, for the whole uh, data set. You, you, you can use this uh, statistical tool for measuring, for instance, the segregation, the different clustering properties of different mm, kind of galaxies. For instance, here you have uh, a plot by Madwick et al. in which you can see uh, mm, star-forming galaxies having a shallow uh, exponent for the correlation function, or uh, uh, QSNs or passive galaxies having a larger uh, exponent for the correlation function and also larger amplitude and the, this ca can be used in many different contexts and as well as we will see later we will use this measurement for uh, taking some good way to understand the dark energy through the baryonic acoustic oscillation. The other way is... Could you go back to the last slide? Yes, sure. I think you mentioned that people since you didn't know that. I didn't know if he knew the result. Yeah, but no, no, what I say is that, that, that when, when, he, when the paper in 69 was published, people didn't know. Then he published a paper in 74. I don't remember, and then if you are, if you are right, if in that paper it was already cited. In the book, of course, it's cited. It's very yeah. But I don't remember if in the paper in, the, in 1974, is cited. You can do it as an exercise. I mean, Peebles, 1974. I am. I'm not sure. At this moment, I was just. He said he doesn't. I don't think that at that moment he doesn't. Obviously, he wrote the book uh, six years later, and in the book you have a very nice reference to Totsuhi and Kihara. What I heard from Bernard, yeah, our supervisor, is that Bernard at the time was postdoc of Jim Peebles. Yes, yes, in Princeton. He was writing, working on the review that he later published, mm -hmm. and he found. Reference to, to, to Shuhi. Shuhi and told that to Jim Peebles. Exactly, exactly. But I think that Jim had already published a paper in '74. You can look Peebles '74. I did and look if there is a reference. Jim was so a Canadian person that if he knew that that paper was published, of course he will reference it. But I did. I don't remember this at this yeah, moment. It was a big issue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, of course, it's clear. It's clear. Okay, let's power spectrum. I mean, this is more a theoretical, friendly, statistical descriptor. I mean, because, you know, we, we like to live in the Fourier domain. I don't know why, but we like to do that. Let's, and, I mean, sometimes uh, I, I like to, yeah, to show this kind of, of, uh, of um, very simple structures to understand here, this. Here we have a long wave one-dimensional 
perturbation, okay? Uh, with a high amplitude, here we have a larger amplitude, uh, and, but the short wavelength. And here we have a smaller amplitude and with also a short wavelength, okay? And this is what we can mm, quantify when we use the power spectrum, okay? For, in, for example, here when we want to quantify the, mm, the clustering, we can see here that in this case we have this mm, long wave and you have this small wave and whenever we superpose, we have this signal in which you are superposing this, this, this uh, pale blue and this uh, more dark uh, blue line, okay? In which you have a very a high amplitude, as we can uh, a long wave and, and high amplitude with a short wave and, short, uh, and, and the short amplitude. And whenever you, you put all together, the, 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 the final distribution has a lot of long power and a little short wavelength power. And this is the kind of measurement that you want to do when using power spectrum. For example, if you use white noise, uh, the power spectrum should be flat because you have, you know, in the white noise, you, you have many uh, oscillations, all of them uh, have the, the same power. In pink row noise, for example, it's different. I mean, you have more or less what you have here, okay? And uh, you have that the, the power spectrum should be a power law like this, okay? This is what, for instance, you can do, try to do this, this SSI proposal by Sarah Bridley. You have one, two, three, A, B, and Z, and then you have to put a rose. You can do it. 30 seconds. You have, one of these is white noise, okay? Which is the A. That means this is easy because I have already said that. And the others are very similar because this is a cartoon, but the others are very similar to the ones that I have also already shown. Okay, I think that you have your solution in your brain. I'm not going to, to you, you should not, ch uh, ch uh, okay, what happens here? It's not given. Oh, ah, it has not been given. Anyway, you have it there. Ah, it was, I forgot to put the, the crosses, but certainly this goes to here, okay, because this is why noise, this goes uh, to here, because you have only one symbol one, and this goes to here, okay? Uh, you, you, you agree with me? All of you agree with me? Great. Okay. Now, the power spectrum. The power spectrum is related with the correlation function, uh, but we can define it as a, uh, for a given uh, density field. We have a density field, and we have the power spectrum of the density field, which is given in these terms, and then this is a realization of a random field. This will be th the theoretical description of the power spectrum. In, in the previous one, what you have was more or less the cartoon, what we are measuring. And the relation between the, the power spectrum and the correlation function can be seen here. The correlation function in real space, in configuration space, is the expected value of uh, the first function that Rin has shown this morning. Okay, in his talk. I mean, when he started to talk about the density contrast, he put this, uh, this uh, function, and the, uh, the correlation function is the product of this function and the expected value of this product, okay? And uh, then we can see that we, you have already seen the way of relating this correlation function with the square density, okay? And now, we, how to relate it with the power spectrum? With the, in, the, in the power spectrum, as we will see in the next uh, slide, is just the Fourier transform. The advantages of the Fourier uh, transform description is that it's more intuitive physically because separate the process in different scales, as I have uh, tried to show you before. The models uh, in theoretical predictions are typically made in terms of the power spectrum, and the amplitudes of the different wave numbers are statistically orthogonal. This is a quite interesting mathematical property. In, in this case, you have the Fourier amplitude of the overdensity field at a given wave number, and uh, these amplitudes are statistically orthogonal. Here you have the kidney theorem, in which you have the, the relation between the power spectrum and the correlation function. They form a, a Fourier transform pair, and assuming isotropy, you have this kind of uh, uh, function. Uh, in, instead of using the exponential, you can just use um, a sinus just to, uh, in the numerator, okay? Another representation, typical representation, you like, for instance, to follow the, the book by John Peacock. John Peacock and many other authors, but John Peacock in particular, always use this uh, other parametrization of the power spectrum, is the delta power, which is just uh, the power multiplied by 
k, k to the third power, okay? K cube, K cube. Okay, with a different normalization. But th this is, both are, are found in the literature. Now, after <coughs> this mathematical talk, because now we, we will see uh, representations of the, of the correlation function and, and the power spectrum in, in the case of the baryonic acoustic oscillations. I am borrowing some slides from Daniel Eisenstein, where he tried to explain the physics of the, uh, the, of the baryonic acoustic oscillations. First, we should say that the important thing here is what we are measuring, as you was said in the film, is something that happened in the very early universe. It's funny because, uh, as uh, you will see here, in these baryonic acoustic uh, oscillations, the, bo the two fossils that we can use for, measure, for, for having information in cosmology, the two main fossils, where today we have information in cosmology from many different observational sites. Ah, no, so many. We have the cosmic micro microwave background radiation. We have the galaxy distributions. The, this is the two fossils I'm now talking about. You have uh, gravitational lenses. You have supernovae. But basically, these are the, the main information that we use to fix the cosmological parameters. The funny thing of the baryonic acoustic oscillations is that both are observed in the cosmic background radiation and in the galaxy distribution, obviously at different redshift. And, but this is important because the, the, the physics underlying the process is the same. Okay? In fact, there are some waves in the early universe. Before recombination, the universe is ionized because uh, uh, it's a high density, it's a high temperature. Uh, as the, it was also said in the, in the, in the, in the film, the, the, the neutral uh, atoms cannot be formed. Uh, you ha we have a plasma uh, where photons provide an enormous pressure and they really behave as a restoring force. And as we have uh, been talking, the, 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 the perturbations that we have at this moment oscillate. Because in fact, what we have is two aspects that are one are against the other. I mean, the matter, as uh, Rin explained us, try to collapse, okay? But when the universe is dominated by radiation, we have that uh, uh, an over mm, density in photons is an overpressure. And this overpressure, when the, 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 imagine that you have a spherical uh, structure collapsing at a given moment, they react uh, because the, the overpressure is higher enough to uh, create an oscillation. And this kind of, of oscillation is what uh, appears in the uh, early universe as uh, baryonic acoustic waves. Okay? I will explain why they are called baryonic in a minute. After, after the combination, things change completely. Universe is neutral. Photons can travel freely, nearly without interacting with anything. Many of the photons that we have for, from the CMB has never interacted with anything. And the phase of, um, at the oscillation of the, of the, uh, um, at the time of the recombination affect the amplitude of the, of the oscillations. Okay, then th that means that we have this, this change that in terms of uh, the beginning of the Big Bang is uh, for about 380,000 years later and 1,100 uh, 1, in redshift, okay? We can see this, for instance, also looking at the, how the density change uh, from the time since the Big Bang, okay? And then we have different epochs here, uh, characterized by different colors. And uh, up, up to the recombination, we have a radiation-dominated universe. Then we have a matter-dominated universe. Well, this, is, this should be the, the matter-radiation cross um, point. And here, in this part of, of, of the history of the universe, the, the, the radiation density is, is higher than the matter density. And uh, later on, we will have a dark energy-dominated universe. Okay? Well, uh, we see this in the film as well. We have more or less what I was telling you. I mean, the photon barrier fluid is sitting in the gravitational potential wells that are seeds of a structure in the universe, the seeds that also Rin was explaining this morning. The gravity tried to compress the fluid. Radiation pressure resists resulting in acoustic oscillations pushing out. It's, mm, it's much like what happens with, the, with, the, um, with a drum. When you put the drum or with uh, the acoustic effect 
of a load speaker. I mean, uh, this creates a, a compressed wave in the air that uh, travels uh, through the air, okay? Because it acts to resist compression, we will represent the radiation pressure uh, abstractly as springs, okay? And the, the gravity uh, as these balls. And then you have already seen this in the field, okay? Uh, and this is the kind of oscillations that are, are produced. What happens with the speed of the sound in this kind of plasma? The speed of the sound is, uh, it was also said in the film, is about 50% of the speed of the light, more precisely 57%. And this can be calculated very easily because this depends on the ratio between the baryon density and the photon density, which uh, is a very small number, it's much, much, much smaller than one for this uh, um, photon dominated universe where the denominator is much larger. That means that this is nearly zero and then this, the sound speed is nearly one over square root of three of the uh, speed of the light. Okay, after the coupling, barriers are free and have nearly no pressure. So they fall on the potential wells of the dark matter. And this is using again the simulations provided by Dan Daniel Eisenstein, what we are going to see now, okay? Here we start, uh, I, I, will, I will not put the film because the film goes very quick. I want to go slowly, but and then I put some frames of the film of uh, the Dani and system prepared a few years ago. Here you have uh, a single adi adiabatic perturbation. Do you want to ask something? Uh, a single adiabatic perturbation in which we, we could separate it in four species. And just we put the same amount for each of them because it's adiabatic. Dark matter in black, gas in blue, the radiation, gas, when we have uh, the baryons, the baryons and the electrons as well, okay? You have the, the radiation, the photons, and we have the neutrinos. And this is just uh, addressive uh, 82,000 because this has been done with CAMBFAST, okay? If you, you, it is a public software, you could do it this easily, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and this occurs uh, um, 110 years after the Big Bang. This is the situation where you have this seat of uh, perturbation, a single one. We are going to follow a single one. And what we are plotting here is um, the mass profiles, which is the density profile multiplied by the radius square to avoid the increase of the volume of the size whenever the, 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 the shell expands, okay? And this is the, the mass profile, density radius square, is represented in front of the Comobin radius, okay? The Comobin radius. Okay, we start now. As we were told, uh, this is uh, later, okay? This is later. Now, now we are going to explain what is going to happen in the different uh, uh, evolutions, okay? This is the evolution of the matter profile from a central unique perturbation. Before the combination, baryons and photons are coupled forming a, a single plasma. The density fluctuations produce some waves with uh, uh, this uh, speed. Uh, here, I think that uh, the square root has been missed. Here, you have to put here a square root. And after recombination, uh, barriers, uh, and at the recombination, barriers decoupled from photons and the sound waves become frozen and imprint a characteristic acoustic scale. What is the value of this scale? You can calculate the value of this scale by doing this integral, the integral from the Big Bang to the time of the recombination of the speed of the sound multiplied by one plus z, the speed of the sound depending on t. This is not trivial, but uh, uh, the way of calculating these 150 megaparsecs, it's something in which we use clearly, and this is the important fact, the data from the CMB. Because in fact, what we need to calculate this quantity is basically, obviously, a value of the uh, Hubble constant today, and a value of uh, the um, uh, density of the dark matter and the density of the dark energy, basically. Basically are the ingredients that come into here. With these in ingredients that they came from the CMB observation, we can measure this standard quantity. And this will be the, the ruler, the standard ruler that we will we use for measuring the baryonic acoustic oscillations whenever we understand what, what they, uh, how this create an imprint in the galaxy distribution. But what is important is theoretically, what is going to happen in this uh, moment from the early universe, from the Big Bang to the recombination, is that one of these waves that start to expand get freeze at a given moment, and at a given moment, when they, it gets freeze, it has a physical scale that in Comovin coordinates. 
it will be 150 megaparsecs, okay? Let's see what is happening in different moments of, this, of the history of the universe. Now we, we are still in a very early universe, uh, 14,000 uh, years after the Big Bang, relative about 7,000. Now, as you can see, the neutrinos being massless, par nearly massless particles, is spread uh, away nearly to the speed of the light, okay? Uh, in fact, mm, because at the, these times they are more light than the photon baryon fluid because both are coupled, okay? Because the, both are mm, coupled, they travel together. You have the, the photon and the gas formed by baryons and electrons uh, coupled in this, in this sense and they uh, expand because certainly the radiation pressure drags the, 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 the perturbation and drags uh, the, the baryons with it, okay? They are traveling together. Dark matter is immune to this radiation pressure and then mm, st stays there, okay? Just waiting for being active in, in a more interesting moment when uh, the gravitational matter plays the important role in the evolution, okay? This is what happens. Uh, and this is the reason that the, the black mm, curb still uh, lies here, okay? We, we keep it in this here, and then we go further away. We are very close to the recombination. Redshift is now 1,440, one yeah? And this is still image. And uh, still we have that, um, the, the main perturbation of the dark matter uh, starts in the center. Uh, it has been uh, spread out uh, uh, slightly, and the gas and the photons are still uh, coupled, uh, forming a single fluid. And um, at a given moment, we see that the neutrinos uh, continue its own travel. And what happens when we reach to the um, nearly, uh, this is a bit later, uh, 1,400. 1,140, okay, we are uh, very close to the, uh, the mm, recombination time. And at this moment, we start to see that the gas at the photon uh, separates, okay? And we will see this later. And what happens in the next one? Here, it's already after the recombination. Redshift now is 100, uh, 848. And you can see that uh, the baryons, uh, the gas, form a peak. The dark matter still uh, is close to the center of the perturbation. And uh, the, the photon starts uh, to separate because uh, the decoupling has already happened. And then photons try to travel alone without interacting uh, uh, with uh, the gas for the rest of the history of the universe, okay? This is just uh, closer to our moment, and as you see here, the baryons and the gas, the baryons and the gas are here, and here is the dark matter. And at this moment, uh, the universe is dominated by matter, and they start to attract each other. Photons are no longer nothing to do with the the the, the, the baryons. Then that means that the the the, bar, the baryon peak is able to attract dark matter, and at the same time, the dark matter center is able to attract baryons. Okay? That means that both are going to increase its amplitude in a, a relatively different way, of course, as you can see here, for instance, for red shift 80, okay, or for red shift 10, okay. This is certainly, again, and then you can see here that uh, the, the, the background of photons and neutrinos just uh, went out. What, import, what is important of this plot is that you have to understand these peaks as uh, the peaks of the mass profile, but if you plot them in density, because you have to remove the square of the radius, that means that the difference will be very, very high. I, I don't think that I don't have here the plot, but this peak is in density of the order of 1% of this one, okay? And as you see, is the dark matter which is driving the, the, the attraction um, uh, to baryons, and uh, the baryons tr tends to average uh, also uh, with the dark matter at a distance of 150 megaparsecs in commobile scales. That means that this is what really is giving you this value of the 
sound horizon, this is the name of this scale, sound horizon, uh, which has been provided by the CMB. That means that up to now, what we have here is more or less clear the physics of the baryonic acoustic oscillations. And at the, at the end of the day, what we have from this physics is a single scale. It's a single scale given by these 150 uh, megaparsecs. And this is provided by the sound horizon and by this simple formula. Okay? Here you have the same thing a massive bulb at the center plus a spherical cell at 150 megaparsecs. It's interesting also to note that the width of this bump uh, at 150 megaparsecs uh, has many uh, things that uh, modify this width. M some nonlinear effects, of course, um, silk damping as well, and uh, also the fact that the recombination uh, do not happen simultaneously. It takes some time to take uh, part. And this, this, all, these factor, all these physical factors have an influence in the width of the secondary peak at 150 megaparsecs. Okay? Okay. Now, we study the evolution of the density around a single initial perturbation, a shell of matter will form around the initial perturbation. And then what we expect to have is that the ga galaxies are formed in the central part of this perturbation, and galaxies are formed also in this ring shape around the central perturbations. That means that having formed galaxies at both distances, we have to be able to measure in the galaxy distribution this distance. OK, let's go ahead. The problem is that uh, this does not has happened only in one place, but has happened simultaneously in many places, like uh, in the film was saying when we threw many stones on a pond. Okay? And therefore, we need to measure this only statistically. Also, because the fact that we should not expect to see visually the rings around the galaxies, like, for instance, in many of the representations that we have seen before, okay? and we will see later. Because the density contrast between the, the, the central peak and the peak at a distance 150 megaparsecs is enormous. Eh? I mean, the distance, the, 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 the bow peak in density represents uh, about 1% of the density in the central peak. As I told before, the funny thing of this uh, proof is that it uh, can be observed both in the cosmic microwave background radiation and in the galaxy distributions. It's well known, and it has a, diff a different name. Uh, in fact, the acoustic peaks in the galaxy distribution have, have to have a, a, a Russian name. It should be Saharov peaks, if you, if you, if you like. And uh, so there are fluctuations on knowledge scales, there are a characteristic angular scale. Looking at this, um, I mean, this was pretty well shown this morning by Rin. I w I'm going to show a different plot. Uh, this is more or less the kind of plots he was showing. And he, he showed this one, but because he was talking about uh, the Netherlands mountains, I decided to put it this one here, which is more or less the same representation, but this is a real representation. This is a real representation of w, uh, w map data. Okay? This is the standard one that you always have seen. I'm sure that many, not many have seen this before. By the way, you have been the first ones to look at the film. I mean, the film at the beginning was a premise here. I mean, we have done the, the first show. I mean, never, no other people, apart of the, myself and the director of the film, have seen the film before. Anyway, this, what is this representation? This is just the South Galactic Pole representation that Rin showed in, in a very nice slide this morning. And if you look, uh, this is mountains, you can do these things. Obviously, in this case, mountains are exaggerated. Certainly, because if you represent the mountains in this, in this uh, sense, you really don't see as much as roughness as you can see here. But it's exactly the idea that Ring gave you this morning. If you represent this as uh, heights and dips and hills and, and, and dips on a uh, common sea level, you will see that the, the, the values were delta t is over the mean, 
or delta t is positive, delta t is mm -hmm. positive, mm -hmm. they are represented here as highs or with the sea level. And the values where delta t is less than zero uh, are the represented here as uh, uh, dips, okay? For instance, as you can see this blue th thing here, this will be more or less this strange here. These mountains here, this will be the, the, the mountains here. And this has to be, they are complementary because what you see here as um, delta t positive uh, and delta t negative, the sea level in each case is the contrary. Is delta t equal to zero or uh, less than one? And that is represented as a sea level. It's another way of representing the CMB. In any case, the characteristics of the, sorry, the, you know, what you see here by the eye, uh, when, when the eye starts to be a Fourier transform machine, is that there is a characteristic pattern. I mean, you know, you really don't see here an Himalaya. And uh, you know, uh, and and it's a characteristic pattern. You know, there, the, 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 you can see mm, mm, this here or here, whatever you like. I mean, although there are fluctuations on null scales, there is a characteristic angular scale that dominates. This angular scale that dominates is the main tone of this distribution, which is typically the the main peak, which has an angular size of about 0.6, which will correspond in Comovin coordinates to. 500 light years, 500 million, million light years, or 100, well, we, we can just talk in, in, in megaparsecs, 150 megaparsecs, okay? Which is here, okay? This is the multipole moment. But in a scale, this will be about 0.6, okay? Correlation function of the, in the harmonic expansion of the uh, density fluctuation of the temperature fluctuations of the CMB when you, you get the acoustic peaks as these different peaks that you have here, okay? And also you can see because it's, do, it's dominated by radiation that these peaks have much, with, uh, they have a lar much larger amplitude than the peaks that we will see later in the galaxy distribution. And this is clear because this is dominated by radiations, okay? And then you have, you know, in these uh, different regimes, the integrated such wolf, the early such wolf, uh, and the acoustic peak regime, and the damping tail in the CLs of the uh, CMB. Okay? That means that in conclusion, what we have is the same physical process evaluated in different epochs using different tracers. Okay? You, we have uh, the CMB that happened. 13.7 billion years ago, and we will be able to see how evolves this uh, baryonic acoustic oscillations in the galaxy distribution whenever we are able to map this at different redshifts, okay? The baryonic acoustic oscillation produces a, a single peak on the correlation function because it's a single scale in which we are able to find more pairs at that separation. It, it will be much more likely to find pairs at 150 megaparsec separation than, for instance, at 140 or at 160, okay? Because you, we have the peak here. This is the way that we can measure this standard uh, ruler uh, using the statistical approach of the, of the galaxy distribution. This single peak in the, in the galaxy distribution that you can see here, and these are three representations of the uh, mm, theoretical uh, correlation function for different models. Here the models are all models with omega total to one and uh, omega lambda to 0.70, okay? The only thing that we have changed here in this different model is the amount of baryonic matter in comparison with the dark matter, okay? And uh, the, uh, the green one, is more or less the standard uh, parameters. Mm -hmm. 0 0.05 for baryonic matter, 0 0.25 for dark matter, and 0 0.70 for uh, lambda, uh, omega lambda, okay? In, if uh, if the, I increase the baryonic component, for instance, in the red line, the, the, the amount of the baryons affect more on the correlation function and also on the wiggles that we can see in the power spectrum. Okay, in the power spectrum, it's like uh, if we put this uh, in, in terms of music, I mean, when you have the length of the string of a violin, 
this imprints a characteristic scale that obviously you can see in different tones, okay? Uh, but it's a single scale. A single peak on the correlation function is translated to a series of wiggles, of damping wiggles, uh, in the uh, power spectrum, okay? And again, depending on the amount of variance, uh, here the, the, the baryonic acoustic oscillations in the red model are quite high, and then you have that it's are more evident. In the model that try to fit the real data, omega variance mm, 0.05, omega dark matter 0.25, omega lambda 0.70, the wiggles are there, but are they, they are very subtle, okay? And with no variance, there will be a continuous curve in the power spectrum, okay? This was first detected by Eisenstein et al. in 2005 and Cole et al. in 2005. Eisenstein et al. using the correlation function and Cole et al. using the power spectrum of the 2DF <coughs> and the first uh, team using the slow and digital sky survey, okay? This is what we can see here. And the standard ruler, this is the important part. The standard ruler comes because the acoustic oscillation scale depends on the sound speed and the propagation time. This depends on the matter to, radi uh, to radiation ratio and the baryon to photon ratio. That means that the CMB and isotropies measure this and fix the oscillation scale. And in a recessive survey, we can measure now this along and across the line of sight. That means that it's like we have an object with a mm, given size, imagine that you have a ball with a given size and you put the ball far away, okay? And then you are able to measure the um, radial distance, the distance along the line of sight and the transverse distance, okay? And the, uh, this will give you directly the two important functions, the angular diameter distance and the Hubble uh, mm, diameter distance. We can see this, it's sketched in this diagram, here is the observer. This should be the radial distance of the, of the object, and this will be the transverse distance of the object, okay? Doing a bit uh, better the things, Bao gives us a standard distance with a fixed commoving value, which is the sound or is the recombination. F for instance, with the data, very old data, but this has not changed too much. This scale is about 153.3 megaparsecs. It can be used as a ruler to measure the geometry of the universe. In a flat universe, we will have that the radial distance will relate with the bow scale in this way. We'll, this will be the difference of redshift of this object here and here, okay? Zeta one and zeta two. Z one and z two will be this delta zeta bow, okay? Obviously, we are considering that this, this is small object, this is constant. The angular distance, uh, came whenever we are measuring the, the transverse direction, okay? And then it came uh, in this expression, and the angular distance depends as well on the uh, Hubble parameters as a function of the red shift. That means that we have a cross check, because here, if we have a perfect uh, uh, standard way of measuring these things, just with the radial distance, we will be able to measure H zeta. This does not happen. In fact, this is what is the alkos pasinski uh, problem. This does not happen in reality. But, you know, theoretically, we will be able to do DDS, and then we will be able to, uh, to measure simultaneously the angular diameter distance, and as a cross-check, we will see that this diameter angular distance agrees with the definitions in which appear the integration of the Hubble parameter as a function of, of set. In, in particular, uh, what we typically do is a constraint of uh, H zeta and uh, uh, the, the diameter distance, okay? Then, just uh, as a conclusion of this part, each initial overdensity in dark matter and gas is an overpressure and launches a spherical sound wave. The wave travels outwards at 57% of the speed of the light. Pressure providing photons the couple at the recombination and then uh, everything gets freezed and CMB travels from there uh, nearly freely and the sound speed plumps uh, uh, abruptly and then wa wave stalls at the radius that provides the standard ruler distance. Over density in shell and the original center both see the formation of galaxies and then the preferred separation is 150 megaparsecs and this has to be seen in the correlation function as a single peak, okay? 
Obviously, the galaxy distribution does not look like this, okay? Because then it will be quite clear. What really happens is that more or less, the centers of the bumps are, this is a cartoon, certainly, but the more, the, I will say that the big allos that we have seen in the simulations and, the, and the, the, that Rin showed this morning will more or less uh, produce these very big clusters. But obviously, these uh, ring-shaped things are much, much less populated than this in this cartoon. That means that the only way to detect it is uh, in a statistical way, okay? And the statistical way is using, for instance, the correlation function of, of the power spectrum. The first detection to a three sigma level uh, on the luminous rate galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and then was confirmed uh, later on on the 2DF uh, with lower sin significance in, in cluster samples, but this was uh, confirmed in many other samples in, in, from 2005 to now. It has been spanned already in 12 years. And the, the, here you see that the observer data come here. The model without uh, baryonic oscillation will be the magenta one, and these models are different models with different cosmological parameters. That means that it's a way also to choose the cosmological parameters that uh, came into the talks by Guido Incarini during these previous days, okay? For instance, uh, I would like just to show you more or less the size of the, of the samples, in the, the real samples in comparison with the acoustic scale. Uh, here we use the small h, that means that the 150 megaparsecs now it's 105 more or less for h of the order of 0.7. Okay, that's the reason that you have here 105 h minus one, but this is the acoustic scale, the sound horizon. Okay, this is the kind of samples that Eisenstein used. I, I plot it in a way that could be more or less. Uh, it's a small uh, slice uh, like the one that Delaprene did in the in the 80s, the Delaparent Hooker and Heller. This is much more deep. I mean, if you, the, the Delaparent slice probably finished at this distance, okay? This goes to redshift 0.5 nearly. This, uh, the, the, the 2DF goes to redshift 0.2. Both are two scales. Both are in a real distribution. I mean, um, this is the galactic plane. They lie where they, ha where they are. This is the uh, right accession. This is the declination in both cases. And you see that certainly in this kind of samples, I, I will be able to map this, this kind of rings if they are there statistically, and they are. Because when we do this eh, for different kind of uh, technically selected samples, uh, some of them volume limited, some of them non-volume limited, using the 2DF as well, we did that and we repeat the calculation by Eisenstein et al. We found the peak. This is a, our results are here. Um, the sustain are these ones with the error bars and the da and the and our errors are just the, as a solid region plotted in here okay using the land salai method and uh, using block bootstrap for the for the errors okay we have this also for the 2df again and uh, uh, well it's clear that the peak is there uh, the width of the peak uh, is larger in our calculation than in the previous ones, but certainly it's something that has been detected. And why, why this is important? Because, for instance, it constrains the cosmological parameters in a way that is different to other cosmological proofs. And I like very much this diagram in which you can see the uh, constraints, for instance, using CMB, W map, of the uh, relation between omega matter and omega lambda, and between the omega <coughs> matter and the W, the density, the, the dark energy parameter, okay? For the equation of a state, okay? In this case, for omega equal to minus one corresponds to uh, a perfect uh, um, cosmological constant, okay? And uh, here you have the constraints coming from, looking for instance to this diagram from the supernova, and this is the constraints that come from the uh, baryon acoustic oscillations, okay? I think that this plot also was shown by uh, Boshan this afternoon, okay? Or in other, or, uh, no, by, in other of the talks in, the, in this school, I have seen it. Okay, this is important. That means that we have a way of measuring the dark energy using a different probe, but obviously the, the measurement is not absolute because we are not in this perfect case in which we can measure it simultaneously h and the diameter distance, okay? Then we have a degeneracy, a degeneracy that is shown here, 
but this degeneracy is complementary to other cosmological probes. Okay? Now, these kind of things uh, can be also seen using a different approaches a part of the, of the correlation function. I am not going into the details because this goes uh, much further away of, of the goals of this school, but in a given moment with one of my students, with Pablo Arnalte Moore, we use wavelets, uh, spherical wave, especially the signed wavelet. Uh, the, uh, we, I mean, a wavelet, I don't know if you have listened about that, basically is a mathematical microscope. And you put it, this onto a distribution or, or onto a, a density field, and the, depending on the shape of the wavelet, you are able to find things. And what we were using were ring-shaped wavelets. And we using we ring-shaped wavelets with three parameters, which was more or less the distance to the, the, the radius of the ring and the width of the ring, we could just follow um, the uh, density distribution in the real uh, galaxy distribution and to try to find the real uh, shape of the uh, baryoc acoustic oscillation rings. And we did it and we succeeded. Obviously, we have to do it in many places simultaneously and at the end sum up, sum up everything. But this is what we get. Okay? This is the radius of this uh, baryonic acoustic instruction reconstruction using wavelets. I have not tell anything about the technique, uh, only this w um, idea of this mathematical microscope looking for shapes within the distribution with our ring light, like this. Okay? I'm, I have a mathematical tool called, in this case, I could call uh, bowlets, if you like it. Eh? Bowlets, because you know the, the world of wavelets, ridgelets, uh, always uh, finish with lets. And I have this mathematical tool that is able to find this kind of structures. When I apply this on the slow and digital sky survey, and I sum up all of my results, just uh, making an average, this is the, the thing that I get. And uh, I get this density in the center. And as I mm, press the film, you can see how this creates. I mean, we recover the 3D shape of the baryonic acoustic oscillation structures, BAP at the center and the spherical cell. And then I can, with this method, determine the radial profile, summing up of the cells, and uh, getting the radius of the cell as an approximation of the acoustic cell or of the sound orifice. In this case, that was our result, okay? which is quite compatible with the results that came from the power spectrum analysis of the correlation function analysis. Well, I would like uh, to finish here, but um, let, me, let me go a bit. But no, I probably go. Because I promised some time for a discussion. I want to. OK. I would like to talk about uh, Alhambra and uh, JPAS and JPAS. J -Pass. And the idea now is um, that up to now we have been dealing with spectroscopic surveys. And many of the proofs that uh, in the previous talk Bohan uh, has shown you, uh, Euclid, for instance, is based on a spectroscopic, sur uh, spectroscopic survey. But this, or JPAS, will be photometric redshift surveys, mm -hmm. okay? And I would like to spend a few moments talking about photometric redshift surveys. The idea is that in this kind of surveys, we need many filters. Particularly, my criticism with uh, DS, with this, is that they have a very um, short number, of, a very low number of filters. Why so many filters? Look at this, the, the problem with, with uh, uh, let me go back a minute. I, want to show, I don't want to show this, but this, only this, okay? If I have a real, this is a simulation, but if I have a real space catalog, real space catalog, the observer is here, you know, it's there, outside. This is mm, in, in, the, in the projection uh, direction. This is re redshift, if you want, or, or pi, the radial direction, okay? And this is the transverse direction, okay? And the, uh, this is real space, where ga all galaxies are placed and its place. If I have a spectroscopic survey, I nearly have this, because the errors in the, in the, in the, in the redshift are 
quite uh, small. Okay, you, you will see later this in a single plot. Okay, but mm, look, if I start to have photometric redshifts, things get worse very easily. For instance, if I have photometric, um, this is this should be redshift space. You know, this is that the distortions between real space and redshift space. Okay, nearly nothing at this is big scales. When you see this at the small scale, you have these kind of effects that uh, Adrian Melo like to show with this bull eye effect, okay? But you know, at very large scale, this is nearly nothing, okay? Now, I am going to apply a photometric redshift errors to these things. And the photometric error, redshift errors are on the line of sight. And typically, they are of this shape, okay? For instance, for broadband filter surveys, a typical one, like for instance the, the Hubble One, or uh, they are of the order of 5% uh, one plus set. For a good sample constructed for photometric redshift accuracy, like Alhambra, it's of the order of 1.5%. But if I want to measure baryonic acoustic oscillations using photometric redshifts, I need a redshift of uh, error of the order of 0.5 or less, as you will see later, like the j pass survey. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is the following. This is the real space, this is the redshift space, and if I distort this with the, redshift, the photometric redshift errors, this is what I get. In the best case, this is the smaller errors that I can get. Look what, how I lose completely the structure. But you know, with the traditional photometric redshift surveys, I was just nearly in this case, you know. Here, you nearly don't see any structure. It has disappeared, just with errors of the order of, of 5%. With 1.5%, the ones that I have in Alhambra, and with 0.5%, uh, the ones that we will have in... in um, now, this is the reason that I need... I will, and I don't want to show this. Why so many filters? I need many filters because the errors decrease with the number of filters, okay? And what we have been studying is, for instance, here you have the Sloan, the photometric uh, redshift survey of Sloan, the Combo 17, the Alhambra survey, okay, that I will talk later, and um, the, the, the J-Pass that we will be still smaller, eh, will be of the order of, of, this, of these errors. Okay, that means that we need to have many filters mm, dividing the whole set uh, of the, of the um, electromagnetic uh, spectrum in a small things. Why is the reason? Because if I want to get a redshift information using five filters, here you have the typical uh, spectrum of, a lip, of an elliptical galaxy, okay? Whenever I have photometric redshifts, <laughs> What I have basically is information of the flux at a different bands, okay? In that case, are broad bands. And I, ha I have these five points corresponding to the five Sloan filters. And with these five points, I have to get an idea of the redshift, the photometric redshift. And certainly this will have an enormous error. For instance, with Alhambra, in which I have 23 filters, 20 in the optical, this is the whole uh, optical range, okay, divided in um, subsets of uh, in filters of the order of 310 Armstrongs in amplitude, in, in, in width. Mm, now I can sample the spectrum in this way, okay? And with J Pass, the one that uh, it was talking at the end of the film, I will really map. The, the spectrum. In the case, for instance, of dealing with an elliptical galaxy, the precision of the redshift will be very, very high with a very small redshift error. And why this is important, huh? and this is the, the last part of my talk because I want to finish, if uh, the chair agrees, 10 minutes before to have some discussion. Why is this important? I now jump a few, because when we prepare this, we are quite optimistic. But then we realize that we need uh, some time. But this is quite, quite the end of the point, and I, I want to reach it. I go directly to the end. This is Alhambra, but I don't want to keep on Alhambra. I, this is the last two ones that I want to show. Again, the same thing. The same thing, OK? Distortions for expected photometric redshifts in a very big 
uh, now you have here real space on the bottom, redshift space, just the, the second uh, from the bottom, the second panel from the bottom, and you nearly cannot see any difference, you know? In a blue line here, you see the sound horizon, or the acoustic scale, as you like to call, okay? This is 150 megaparsecs, or 105, because this is megaparsecs over H, okay? 105, okay? That means that if I have real space or redshift space, if I have a redshift space, it's fantastic. I certainly can do what Euclid will do, will, will be more or less the second panel from the bottom, okay? All the photometric redshifts will be the top two panels. The, the, mm, the one in the, in the, in the, the fourth panel, the, in the, in, starting from, uh, from above, from, uh, uh, above is the, uh, with a redshift of 0. Point, with, a red, with a redshift error of 3%, okay? And certainly you have nearly lose all the structure, okay? And in the third panel, you have what is expected for JPAS or POW or other survey, which is the one that is marked in red here. You have the distortions, which is of the order of 0.3%, one plus set, plus peculiar velocities. Peculiar velocities are all, all uh, in, in all of them. You know, in redshift space uh, with um, good uh, spectroscopic resolution, you have perfect resolution, but this is quite hard to get. It's qu very difficult to get. There are many proofs that are working in photometric redshifts, but you need a precision at least of this order, of 0.3%. Why? And this is the end of the talk. Why? This is a simulation again, but this is mocks of the real j pass. okay? And what I have done it here is to have a slice from 0.2 to 0.4 in redshift, okay, of the simulation, okay? And uh, um, this is a quarter of, uh, of the sphere simulation, but just from 0.2, uh, an, an octave of the, of, the, of, the, of the sphere, okay? A quadra, a single quadra, from 0.2 to 0.4, okay? And here, what you have is that the, uh, uh, this is the, you know, the, the exact uh, positions, the exact redshift of the simulation, and now, now I, st I start to distort this with, uh, Values of, of the errors of 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and 1%, okay? This is more or less what I had in Alhambra, for instance, and this is what I expected to have in j -Pass, in the Havalambre survey, okay? Now, if I measure the correlation function, well, I, I want to say something here. I, this is the thing that I have skipped but I can explain it without any diagram. Up to now, when I have presented the correlation function, what I have done is to consider an isotropic correlation function, okay? But certainly the, 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 the galaxy distribution is not isotropic. It's not isotropic because, for instance, one thing, the peculiar velocities that creates the finger of gods, the clusters, elongates in the line of sight uh, direction because of the fingers of God. In fact, this moves to uh, Davis and Peebles in 83 to measure the correlation function as a function of two distances. The radial distance, the distance between two galaxies in the radial direction and the transverse distance, okay? This is important because what they did was to decompose the correlation function not as an isotropic one, but as an isotropic function, depending on these two distances. And for instance, they could model the fingers of God using that, okay? And it was uh, quite interesting to do this. For instance, this has been done in many papers, uh, nature paper by John Peacock with a very beautiful um, picture looking for the uh, nonlinear distortions, okay? The problem is that Whenever you can measure the correlation function in, in two distances, uh, you realize that this is quite important uh, when, it, when using uh, the idea of photometric redshift. Because whenever you see these kind of things, for instance, here is the observer and you have the distortions, you could think that you are lost, that you have lost all your structure. This is not true. You have lost the structure visually, but the structure remains in the transverse direction, not in the radial direction. Obviously, in the radial direction, you are nearly lost, 
But in the transverse election, there is a lot of information. That means that what you have to measure is the correlation function in the transverse direction. Okay? This is called transverse correlation function or projected correlation function. And it is the, y, the, 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 the quantity that typically is uh, measured in the model samples. Okay? The transverse correlation function. You can measure this quite easily in the photometric redshift surveys. And from the transverse direction, you can re recover the theoretical uh, three-dimensional uh, correlation function within an integral, okay? which is very easy. Because you have the all the information that you have keep in the transverse direction is very useful. And basically, what you are doing is a convolution with the transverse direction, if you want. It's a simple way of doing that. That means that keeping this information, you can still measure many properties of the cluster at the smaller scales, better, of course, but even at large scales. But at large scales, if the redshift errors, the photometric redshift errors are large, you are lost. But if the photometric redshift errors are of the order of the ones that we expect to have with the j -pass or other photometric redshift surveys that are going, we are able to measure the baryonic acoustic peak as well. And this is the last transparency in which you can see here how this is the correlation function uh, this multiplied by the, sc the scale uh, square. Okay? Basically, uh, this will be, let me go fast, very fast, will be the same plot that I show here. Uh, I can, uh, this goes, but anyway, no, no, I cannot go. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is, <coughs> okay, exactly this, this, this diagram here, okay, uh, but uh, multiplying this by a square, the square of the distance, okay? In order to see this uh, as a big bump, okay? Now I go ahead. I go ahead. I have not shown this. And now, this is the same quantity, but multiplied by the, the distance square. And now, what we have here is the, the real data with no shifts, with no random shifts. <laughs> and with random shifts, like you have seen here, this is just random shifts with different er uh, photometric errors. And whenever I have the error of 0.3%, I, I am still able to see the, 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 the scale. Uh, the important thing is here to have the scale of the acoustic peak. I lose completely the scale with errors of 1% of errors of 0.7%, okay? But with 0.3%, I am still able to find the acoustic peak using photometric redshift survey. Yeah, this is quite important because otherwise we couldn't spend literally millions of euros just doing this kind of projects. We have for sure that doing photometric redshift and measuring the photometric redshift of 90 million galaxies using j -pass, we will be able to, to get very accurate um, values for the correlation function. And certainly because it will be a very deep sample, we will see this at different redshift range. And that's it. Now, is uh, at some point, yeah, I understand, of course. Uh, at some point, uh, or at what point, it's not worth it anymore. Now you have 56 filters, and uh, instead of having a spectrum, but I am capable of building a good spectrograph, okay? Mm -hmm. So at what point, and of course you have 56 filters, you have they must be narrow. I yeah, mean, they're very so narrow. In fact, 100 so uh, Armstrong, nearly. You were between 3,000 and 8,000 Armstrong. And mm -hmm. you can do that with a spectrum. So at what point is not worth it anymore? I think you are very close to the point that is more convenient to get spectra. Yeah, no, no, this is clear. I mean, if you are able to get a spectra, that is, of course, for sure, much better. The problem is that if you want to get 90 million redshifts using a spectra from the earth, 
you need the whole set of big telescopes devoted for you for the rest 100 years and then you have finished okay 100 years from now because uh, you, we are talking about 90 millions of galaxies. The, the field of view, give me the field of view. The field of view is three degrees. Three degrees. We are getting three degrees uh, um, in simultaneously. No, no, I agree that we do that also spectroscopically. Yeah. But we, I, and so, you, yeah. Because spe so spectroscopically. Field of view the yeah, what happens here is because the, we have designed <laughs> the telescope and the camera. Uh, to account for yeah, this project, this. we have decided a very big field of view of three, degree, three degrees in diameter that gets a large area. I mean, the, the whole set of the of the of the of, of the order of this size. I mean, the the, the, yeah. the filter try uh, is of this size. That means that you are really able each night to get thousands of photometric redshifts. Thousands. That means that in uh, four or five years you can reach. Uh, to the competitive numbers, and if we want to do it before Euclid uh, is launched, we have to start already. Otherwise, we are lost. I mean, the, prob the, 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 the problem with photometric redshift is these ones. I mean, you have pictures of the skies with many filters, mm -hmm. as opposite to fibers looking to the positions of the sky that uh, they have also problems with robots, with fiber collisions. Uh, you need a very big telescope to have good resolution for the spectrum, and you know. It's something that you have probably, and I am quite um, mm, complementary in science. Of course, uh, Euclid is a fantastic project, and uh, the, it will give a lot of very beautiful results. But I think that in this case, the JPAS project will be finished earlier and will probably provide many constraints of the dark energy using baryonic acoustic oscillations. Distribution of galaxies. Well, it's in fact, I will say, if I really agree, that it is a feature of the cosmic way, uh, of the cosmic way, but it is quite subtle. I mean, whenever you see the cosmic web, you see, mm, as uh, Rin explained it, filaments, uh, uh, clusters where the filament cross, very big, uh, empty, nearly empty voids. And uh, uh, all this stuff, I think that he also showed a, a diagram in which we see more or less the length scale of the filaments with we will say, I don't remember the numbers, but we will say that it will be about 60, 80, h, megapas h minus 1 megapascals length. I mean, we are talking about a much larger area, a much larger length. I mean, 100 uh, in the same scale, 110 h minus 1 megapascals. Everything at this scale is very subtle. I mean, the correlation function is nearly zero at that scale. It's still positive, but it's nearly zero. And uh, that means that it's a very subtle effect. And it's very hard to measure because also there are many nonlinear effects that affect. For instance, think on, on, on because the, the nonlinearity of, 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 of the process, not all the galaxies lie exactly at 150. One uh, are a bit uh, apart, one are at a bit closer. Fortunately, because you isotropicalize the process, uh, what at the end you get is. Uh, the, 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 the length of the correlation of the, of the acoustic scale that you get from the correlation function has been abbreviated all the, many of these effects. But there are others that can be dealt with. For instance, these nonlinear effects of bias. For instance, in fact, what we really know from the physics is that what we happen is an enhance of the density of baryons and dark matter. But we are not seeing the dark matter. We are believing that the galaxies are tracing well the density field, but this could, could not be true. I mean, we could have a, 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 a non-known bias between the galaxy distribution and the matter distribution, and this will affect certainly again the, the determination of the acoustic scale using 
uh, statistical approaches like the correlation function of the, two, of the power spectrum. Although I may add a slight historic remark concerning our good friend M. Sar, mm -hmm. who wrote in around 1997 oh, yes. yeah. an intriguing short paper about the correlations of clusters of galaxies. And he interpreted this within a uh, distribution of clusters in a kind of a cellular network. And to his, the, on my astonishment, he found a scale of around 140 megaparsec in that clustering of clusters. And I asked him several times, do you think you found the BAO scale before anyone else? But N says no. Yeah. But it remains an intriguing finding. Well, also do you remember that it was our time that Brodhost et al. Exactly. Found from this 128 uh, yeah, that in, was in even the pencil five, beams. That was even five years before that. Right? Yeah. Exactly. yeah, yeah, but you know, many times uh, they have appeared, uh, and in that case, I remember that uh, I think that Peter Coles wrote a paper about the Borono interpretation of these kind of things because, or you did, uh, I don't remember who, but uh, you know, in, in that case, that means that many times we have found characteristic scales. But what I should say is that this one, has a clear physical background in our standard cosmological model that I think that it was the main part of uh, the first part of my talk. The second one was how to detect it is using a statistical approach because the effect is so thin, so, so small that you need a lot of statistics to get uh, a rel reliable information of the acoustic scale. Other question? Other question? Yeah. One question. Because I probably didn't get some basic idea. Uh, we are looking for this uh, over density regions, uh, the strings of about uh, 150 megaparsec yes. And uh, uh, are there, uh, if we are looking for them, is, are there ever rings of the same radius? Or yes, yes. I mean, if, if, of course, in the structure, there are many characteristics. I mean, when you see, for instance, the structures, you see, uh, for instance, the, the, the voids uh, have different scales, but there are some which more or less are of a characteristic scale, and they are surroundings by walls, and then you could interpret this as, as rings, and this will not be the acoustic scale rings from the baryonic acoustic oscillations. Certainly, what happens is that this feature of 150 is ubiquitous. And it happens everywhere. And it's something that as much larger is your sample, much better you can uh, measure it. But it's, it's something that uh, exists in the whole universe and also in, 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 the, in, the, in the cosmic background radiation. It's the same physical uh, characteristic. It's something that happened, as I tr have tried to explain, in the very early universe that has created an imprint in the CMB and a different imprint, but also measurable in the galaxy distribution. Obviously, the CMB is much more pronounced. I mean, it's, it, the, the peaks are, uh, um, have a higher amplitude. In the, in the case of the galaxy distribution, it's much more subtle. That is the reason that only 12 years ago was measured for the first time. But it's something that um, now many people is interested because gives a very clean measure of the evolution of uh, the <coughs> acceleration of the universe. Because given that you have a standard ruler, you put this ruler at different epochs. And what you are seeing, more or less, is how the expansion of the, the universe is changing. Because the apparent size will inform you about the, the, ex the acceleration of the expansion, the apparent size of this ruler. Because the ruler has a fixed the, the scale. This is the point, OK? OK, I think if there are no more questions, then we should call it a day for today. And uh, we should thank the speaker, Vicente, for coming to <laughs> the intriguing talk. And tomorrow at 9.30.